Dr. John Belk is from Intelligent Concrete. I'm David. And we're here today to talk to you about... It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Colloidal silica. Originally developed or patented in 1959, first brought to the United States by the great Brian H. Green from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at the Engineering Research and Development Center in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Lovely town. So Brian H. Green brought colloidal silica to the United States in, I think it was 98, 99 time frame. Yeah, wasn't hard considering the size. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so Brian Green brought it to the U.S., um, used it as a viscosity modifying admixture for a rock matching grout where he was using hematite sand in this very fluid grout. Hematite sand, which is like a metallic sand, kept falling out of solution, was using dextrose and xanthan gums, which were making the concrete icky and sticky and hard to use, or the grout icky and sticky and hard to use. So we ended up using this colloidal silica, which not only kept the hematite sand in solution, but it also densified it, reduced the permeability, increased the strength, reduced the wave attenuation, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, really cool stuff. Cool stuff. I mean, let's look at the word colloidal. What does that mean? It means stays in solution. So. Yeah, so milk is a colloidal suspension of fat and proteins. Right. So colloidal silica is a universal dispersion of nano silica particles. And when we say nano, we mean particles that are somewhere between 1 to 100 nanometers di diameter. And if you don't know what a nanometer is, the literal translation is nano 10 to the minus 9th meter. And to give you a reference, a nanometer, or let's say human hair, obviously not on my head, but most human... Tough room, man. <laughs> a little bit of chuckle. <laughs> is around 100,000 to 150,000 nanometers in diameter. And the, the impetus, the reason why we use colloidal silica, or those nano silica particles in solution, is to effectively manipulate the molecular kinetics of cement hydration to increase the strength and durability of concrete. Ultimately, to make it stronger and last longer. Good discussion, Dr. Belkowitz. Um... That was great, great science, great cement chemistry science. I've got more of it, too. Oh, I know, I know, that's why I interrupted you. Um, put it simply, everyone, we've got very fine, very, very fine sand that stays in solution. It's silica, which is sand, it's colloidal, which stays in solution, just to put it, put it simply. But it is so tiny that it has a very reactive surface area, and that colloidal silica, that surface area, consumes calcium hydroxide, what some people call the cancer of concrete, <laughs> to create more of the superhero <laughs> of concrete strength, the calcium silicate hydrate, ultimately reducing the pore sizes, the pore solution, and the pore connectivity of concrete to make it stronger and less longer. Well, let's talk about stronger. I mean, that's that's stress drain guy here. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's <laughs> nice to meet you, Dr. Valkowitz. I'm the stress drain guy. Um, so let's talk about that, about the strength, the stronger. Right. Uh, strength, of course, we've gone over this many, many times. Strength is the stress at which things fail. So we're talking about making the stress higher, making it greater so it doesn't fail. Right. And we've run a lot of tests here in the lab, my golly. Uh, totally. Oh man, have we run a lot of tests here? Um, yeah, we've done uh, dumpsters full of cylinders here as, as they go out. We're actually doing dumpters worth of cylinders. Yeah, right yeah. I saw that this morning. We've got a room full of cylinders uh, coming into the process. So, um, But it does just that. I mean, we've seen numbers, I don't think we've ever mixed a mix, that when we have a reference mix, ASTM C494, pretty, yes, pretty standard mix, water, sand, cement, um, pretty pretty standard, right. about 4,000 PSI. Um, you know, kind of a little plain James, that's the whole point, is to make a standard reference and then you have a one parameter variation, you can change one thing, we add the colloidal silica in, and what do we get? Well, golly, we get, for compressive strength, we get 
15% greater, 25% greater. Sometimes even more. Sometimes even 50% right, greater. Right, 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 right. We get way higher early strengths. The right. One to three to seven days are way higher. Skyrockets. Skyrockets. And then it has a tendency to level off a little bit up in the 28, 56, 90. Still stronger. Still stronger. But it has a tendency. It's not that, you know, great, great difference like it is sure. at early. So. Let's look at that advantage. I mean, if we're making pavements or we want to strip farms and buildings, I mean, we get really high, early, high, much higher early strength, so we can move forward with the process. And then we've looked at flexure. Um, well, let, let's go back to that high early strength. Years ago, I was working on a fast track pavement for yeah. Colorado Department of Transportation, right. and it was a beautiful mix. We got 3,500 psi in four to six hours right. from placing, which means open traffic, right. roll it on down the highway. The problem, though, was the accelerators that we were using, calcium nitrite, nitrate, sodium thiocyanates, chlorides, they would normally create a very porous microstructure. So while we did get the higher early strengths, we often saw a strength regression at 28 days from a reference. Right. Not only that, though, we also saw, because of that porous microstructure, they were more susceptible to the chemical attack from de-icing salts and de-icing brines. Yeah, freeze thaw and... Uh, totally, the physical attack from that. The other things. You know, back in the last century, out on the field, you always say, well, you know, salt speeds it up, sugar slows it down, so... <laughs> By using colloidal silica, we can still get that speeding up time. Right. But we're creating more dense microstructure. Absolutely, you know. Um, so let's look at the other properties that, you sure. know, that we've measured. We've measured flexural strength, which is a, a tension, essentially a tension measurement. What do we get there? Well, same thing. We got 28 days, we're getting 20% greater, 25% greater strength uh, compared to the reference, getting some good numbers. But isn't flexural strength a measure not just of tension, but a combination of tension and compression? Well, yeah, we just did a video about a week ago on that on Math, really? on Math Monday. I wasn't a part of it? No, you were in New Zealand. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Vacation. No, right, vacation. Vacation. But if only. You were off in New Zealand working with our new client in New Zealand. But we derived that expression. Okay. We used the phone beam, which everybody's seen. We Love that thing. Yeah, that's pretty cool. We derived that expression showing that flexural strength is just essentially the stress on the outside fiber. So. The, the reason why I asked that, during my PhD, one of my advisors asked me, will using excessive amounts of colloidal silica increase the tensile strength or make the concrete more ductile or will it make the concrete brittle? And at the time, I was like, ah, colloidal silica is the best. It's going to make it more <laughs> ductile. But that being said, when we did you know, fast fracture tests and brittle tests, Using an excessive amount, especially the larger particles, we saw colloidal silica become more brittle. And this is excessive amounts, like amounts that will make the concrete icky, sticky, nasty to use and exceed a normal concrete budget. So bear that in mind. But that being said, we saw a reduction in our tensile strength, a reduction in our ductility when we used it at higher dosages. My question to you is, what do you think would happen to the modulus of elasticity when you're using excessive dosages of your colloidal silica? Well, I would, what we've done here with modulus measurement to date, we did some, some tests for that. And with reasonable amounts, with the amounts that probably are reasonable for a mix, we saw the line become steeper, right. which is stiffer. Right. So it was a little stiffer, so that's just what you said. Right. It becomes sticky or however you want to express that. But in a linear elastic sense, since the proportional limit was higher, we the strain at the proportional limit was also higher. Right. So in that sense, we didn't gain any brittleness because the, the lower strain at the lower modulus and the higher strain at the higher modulus are both still at the proportional limit. For, for the material. So based off of what I just said at those excessively high dosages, what do you think would happen to the strain if we had retested it? Well, uh, I think if we did excessive levels of doses, we're probably gonna, it's probably going to become a lower strain at the proportional limit. Then that makes sense. So that would be a one definition of brittleness, that you're, you're lowering, lowering the strain at the performance limit.
Right, right. And, right. you know, using colloidal silica is an amazing technology and it can answer a lot of issues. You know, I have this fun sentence that I said, effectively manipulate the molecular kinetics, blah, blah, blah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Not nice. Not nice. <laughs> but where we've seen colloidal silica really shine, because, you know what, it's not hard to make concrete stronger. <laughs> it's not hard to make <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, most people, what they do is throw a little bit more cement, pull back their water, put right. an accelerator in there. Those, those solutions don't really answer the bigger problem, which is durability. And a lot of our durability problems come from excessive amount of cement, some microstructure, um, or the, the environment as well as the other materials. By using colloidal silica, we can provide a solution to ASR, de-icing attack, corrosion of steel, so on and so forth, and deal with a lot of these problems. Well, here in the lab, I know we've run a lot of those tests because they come across my desk to look at um, and sign off on those. And we've run abrasion is an excellent example. Oh my gosh, underwater abrasion. Well, let's talk about regular abrasion first. We ran the standard abrasion test, which is the steel balls under pressure, simulates warehouses with forklifts, simulates pavements, simulates any situation where you've got pressure right. on the concrete. And what do we see with that when we use reference versus colloidal silica? Anywhere between a 30 and 60% reduction oh, in abrasive wear? Absolutely. We saw Gorgeous. at least 50%. Right. I don't think I've ever seen data we ran here. But the well. stuff that we did with my PhD, where yeah. we did low, low, like 0.009% yeah. yeah. of the small particles, right. we saw like 15%, 20%. One short point on underwater, though. It's yeah, yeah. So I love that test. Such a cool test. That's where we spin balls with a paint mixer simulates uh, sand or gravel and flowing water, simulates pipelines, waste plants, dam, lot, levees, spillways, flip buckets, um, all test. those kinds of things. I wonder what we saw when we did that. Well, by golly, we did that here. Oh my gosh, and I have a set of samples. <laughs> so here we've got two samples we did underwater. We swished the balls around, the gradated steel balls with a paint mixer. And it's just like a, a field situation, a miniaturized field situation. Here's the reference. Look at all this gravel. Look at this groove we made. Look at all this abrasion. Here's colloidal silica. What's that, what's that look like, John? It's so pretty. <laughs> you can actually see, you can see the paste at the top surface. And yeah, you're starting to see some of the aggregate underneath that top sacrificial layer. But this is just absolutely gorgeous where you're not seeing that exposed aggregate. So the steel balls or that simulation of erosion, the concrete was just too tough to allow it in that time limit, which I believe was 36, 36 or 72 hours that we did to tear away that top surface and expose that aggregate that was underneath. Oh, I love this test. Yeah, this is a great test. And let's put the time in perspective. One of the things we do in the lab is miniaturize size. But one of the other things we do in the lab is shorten time. So we're running a test that is so aggressive that 36 hours may stimulate 10, 15 years. We're miniaturizing time in the lab totally. by running this test. But the comparison, I mean, the coil, there's no comparison. Coil of silica is just great. It's not fair to compare it almost. Reference, not so great. Not so great. <laughs> so, uh, thanks for joining us today. We had a fun time talking about it. And hey, if you're ever in the ne our neck of the woods and you want to come and check out some of these tests, we're more than willing to give you a quick tour. So thanks for joining us today. Don't forget, if you've got any concrete questions or concrete concerns, shoot us a comment or a direct message. Like, subscribe, comment. That stuff. Let us know how you're doing. Go concrete. Beat asphalt.